I am Shelby Mathis, the Small Business Ombudsman at the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, and this is our third monthly webinar. Today's topic is going to be on cloth diapers. And as a disclaimer, I am a CPSC staff member and I've put together this presentation, so it may not reflect the views of the Commission because we are an agency that's headed by five commissioners. So the agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to start out, and I've tried to make this as practical as possible for those of you that are either manufacturing, importing, or selling uh, cloth diapers. We're going to talk about labeling and testing requirements on those cloth diapers and what applies. Once you know what testing requirements apply to your product, we're going to talk about how to find a CPSC accepted testing lab, which is mandated because this is a children's product and the CPSIA requires that children's products be tested by CPSC accepted testing labs. So we're going to talk about how to find one of those. And then for those of you that are registered as a small batch manufacturer or may be considering registering as a small batch manufacturer, we'll talk about the benefits associated with that. First of all, how to qualify and then what the benefits may be. Uh, if you are a manufacturer or an importer of cloth diapers, although there's some caveats there for importers, uh, much harder to qualify as a small batch manufacturer. So mainly focused on domestic manufacturers there. And then we'll do uh, something that I hope that you guys find uh, fun, which will be interactive audience polling, where I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and then we're going to get uh, feedback. You guys are going to guess the answers, and we'll talk about what the actual answers are on several questions uh, pertaining to cloth diapers. I'll talk about children's product certificates. We'll actually go through an example of a children's product certificate uh, specific to cloth diapers and what information needs to go in what section. And then I'll highlight a children's apparel recall example that is not a cloth diaper, uh, but it is a defect uh, recall associated with children's apparel. And I'll talk about why it's a good example uh, for this product at that time. I'll, hi I'll highlight some of the CPSC business resources uh, that our office makes available to you guys and let you know where to find those resources. And then finally, we'll do a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So uh, first off, for labeling and testing requirements, let's take a look at labeling. Um, cloth diapers require tracking information because it's a children's product, and tracking information needs to be permanently affixed to the product and the packaging. And we get a lot of questions in our office about what it means to have appropriate tracking information on your product and packaging. You want to make sure that four things are covered. The first thing is you want the manufacturer or private labeler name if it's being made domestically. If it's being made overseas uh, or um, even you know, to our northern neighbors or southern neighbors uh, in North America, then you're going to want to put the importer name uh, on the product and the packaging. You also need to make sure that the location and date of production of the product is included uh, in your tracking information. And I will touch on some frequently asked questions uh, right after this slide that will kind of highlight what that means in certain contexts. You want to also include the third piece of information, which is detailed info on the manufacturing process, which includes batch or run number information. If you use that in your manufacturing process, it can be a very good way to isolate within your production line where there could be an issue associated with the product. And then finally, the fourth piece of information is any other info that's going to help a consumer ascertain the source of the product, because that is the purpose of permanent tracking information. And one thing that uh, I like to recommend here is the website for your business uh, for two reasons. One, makes it a lot easier for a consumer that might be having an issue with a product um, that they've gotten from your company to get in touch with you. And then the second thing is, uh, it's free advertising, right? If they like the product, they can see the website and go onto your website and order more uh, products straight online. So um, there are frequently asked questions section on our website, and I've got the address there, cpsc.gov forward slash tracking label. Again, this appears as a hyperlink in the handout on the right-hand side of your screen. In the PDF version of this presentation, it is actually a hyperlink that takes you right to the frequently asked questions slide or the, free, sorry, the Frequently Asked Questions page on our website. So with that being said, let's take a look at some of the Frequently Asked Questions that we get on tracking information that might apply to the cloth diapers that you might be designing or manufacturing. So what meets the location of production requirement um, for permanent tracking information? Well, if it's being made domestically, city, state, and country of manufacture, so uh, where I'm physically standing today, it would say Bethesda, Maryland, USA. And that would meet the location of production requirement. 
If it's being made in another country, you'll want to put the province and the country. And then uh, what happens if you're importing a product? Question we get frequently is should an importer's name appear on the tracking label instead of the manufacturer's? And the answer is yes. If the product is being manufactured outside the United States, the importer's name is going to need to take the place of the manufacturer's name on those four pieces of information on the tracking label. Another question that we get very frequently, do I need to test the tracking label uh, and certify its compliance? And the answer here is no. However, the way that you decide to mark your consumer product cannot introduce lead into a children's product. So uh, you want to be careful in the material that you choose if you're going to permanently affix a fabric tracking label. And then uh, another frequent question, if you're using disposable packaging, does an adhesive label on disposable packaging meet the permanently affixed on packaging requirement? And the answer here is maybe, and it depends on how adhesive that label is. If this is a label that is actually going to stay on the disposable packaging such that it reaches the consumer, then that is a permanently affixed label on packaging and would meet the requirement. However, if it's going to fall right off, that would not meet the requirement for permanently affixing a tracking label on packaging. So um, let's take a look at testing requirements. And I will try to highlight some of the um, questions that we get on cloth diapers specifically that kind of confuse it with other different types of consumer products because I think uh, it'll help you guys figure out what applies to the products that you are working with. So the first thing, it's a children's product. So lead content and accessible components applies and that is from Congress. That's 15 USC Part 1278A and the level there for lead content and accessible components is 100 ppm. For lead and paint and surface coatings, and this would be uh, a coating that doesn't sink or uh, I guess fully absorb into the substrate, that standard uh, is 90 ppm or that limit, and that's from our regs, that's 16 CFR part 1303. So we've got the two types of lead testing that could apply to your cloth diapers depending on how they're constructed. Uh, the third thing is flammability testing. And uh, there is a general wearing apparel flammability standard, which is our reg 1610. And then there's one uh, for vinyl plastic film, much less applicable on cloth diapers, although we do get some questions um, on accessible diaper, diaper inserts that might involve uh, vinyl plastic film, and that's 1611. But apparel flammability standards do apply. Most likely it's going to be 1610 that applies to your cloth diapers in terms of testing procedure. And a note here, and you know this is here because a lot of questions come into our office related to whether or not cloth diapers are considered children's sleepwear. The answer is they are not. Uh, and the reason that we get that question is because children's sleepwear, as many of you know, is subject to a more stringent flammability standard, also in our regulations, which is 16 CFR, 1615, and 1616. Uh, so our agency does not consider uh, cloth diapers as children's sleepwear. And the, uh, the fourth bullet here is also based on a question that we frequently get is whether or not cloth diapers need to be tested for phthalates. Uh, as many of you know, toys and child care articles that facilitate sleeping and eating are subject to phthalates limits, uh, and the phthalates there can exceed more than 0.1%. There are six types of phthalates that either are temporarily banned pending a final rule from the commission or permanently banned in plasticized components. However, this does not apply to cloth diapers. They are not considered a child care article that facilitates sleeping and eating, and they're certainly not a children's toy. So no phthalates testing is required on cloth diapers. Once you have met all of your testing requirements, you'll want to make sure that you properly certify that you've met these requirements, and you do that through creating a children's product certificate. And we'll go through an example of that, and hopefully you'll find that useful. Uh, I'll also refer you to some resources on our website. In terms of obligations of who needs to create a children's product certificate, it is importers and domestic manufacturers that are responsible for making sure that a CPC has been created and is in place to cover the cloth diapers that they may be importing or manufacturing. All right, let's take a little harder look at each of the testing requirements because there could be, uh, depending on the type of material or the way that you are constructing your cloth diapers, there could be ways that you would be um, 
able to avoid testing in certain instances. So the first requirement that was on that bulleted list from the slide before was lead content testing from 15 U.S.C. 1278A. You remember the limit there is 100 ppm in accessible components. However, keep in mind that there is a pretty extensive list of materials that we know after years and years of testing within our agency that are not going to exceed the lead limit as long as they're in an untreated, unadulterated state. And those materials, I've highlighted some here and I'll go through those, uh, are in 16 CFR 1500.91. And again, that's a hyperlink right to that regulation that is available on the PDF handout on the right-hand side of your screen. The reason I um, wanted to hyperlink the regulation for you is not so you can go and read regulations, which I know non-lawyers find really exhausting and no fun. It's because I've done my best here to highlight each of the materials that I think may apply to your cloth diapers, but that regulation has a pretty extensive list, um, the contents of which I could not list, or I guess I could list, but it might be a little bit exhaustive for our purposes today. So if you are using a textile that's not on this list, check the regulation and see if it's there, um, because if so, you might be able to avoid total lead content testing under 1278A. So what are the materials? Uh, the first one is uh, wood, paper, and similar materials made from wood. Uh, we've had some questions about cloth diapers. I guess they're um, are some innovations in the way of textiles that are being created from wood and paper derived products. So those would fall under that exemption or likely would. Um, you're welcome to reach out to us with specific questions on textiles that you might have. And then uh, if we internally need to get a decision um, from our experts within our agency, we're happy to do that. But wood, paper, and similar materials made from wood are listed in 1500.91 as not requiring total lead content testing. Uh, the second bullet here is CMYK process printing inks. And why is this important? Uh, CMYK process printing inks uh, fully absorb into the substrate. Um, so they are listed as um, not requiring total leg content testing. And then natural fibers, uh, dyed or undyed, including but not limited to, and again, I've had, tried to highlight here a lot of the materials we get questions on, but there's a much more extensive list online. Cotton, linen, hemp, bamboo, sisal, silk, and sheep's wool uh, in dyed or undyed states as long as they are untreated. Uh, and then manufacturing or manufactured fibers also dyed or undyed, including but not limited to rayon, lyocell, acetate, triacetate, rubber, polyester, nylon, acrylic, motoacrylic, and spandex. Additionally, I've added, um, this is based on um, agency uh, guidance that we've received internally from our staff, that Velcro and Applex, which are two materials that are frequently used in cloth diapers, would be considered textiles that fall under 1500.91. It would not require total leg content testing. Also important to remember here, there are other components on your cloth diapers besides the fabric that you make them of. And you should think of the products that you are creating kind of like a puzzle with a bunch of different pieces. And you need to look at each of the pieces and see whether or not um, different types of testing would apply based on how the pieces come together. So for zippers, snaps, and other fasteners that would be made of like a metal or a poly resin, you want to make sure that those comply with the total lead limit on substrate. And then polyurethane laminate, or pull, we get questions about frequently on cloth diapers, would not require testing if it's inaccessible. However, it's not on the list of 1500.91, so if it is accessible, it would require total lead content testing. Colorants uh, may be a source of lead, so you want to think about how you're coloring and dyeing your um, textiles that you're using, and depending on the types of inks and colorants that you're using to do so, they could be a source of lead that would require total lead content testing. And again, testing labs can uh, very frequently help you determine whether or not lead content testing would be needed. You're also um, welcome to reach out to our office and um, we can forward internally to the experts here at the agency to help you figure out whether or not testing would apply. For lead in paint and surface coatings, this was the second bullet point on that uh, four bullet point list that we talked about for testing requirements. This is straight from our reg. You remember for paint and surface coatings, the limit is 90 ppm. Unfortunately, on paint and surface coatings, there's no exceptions and exemptions, like we just talked about 
for total lag content. However, the um, thing to remember here is that if you don't have paint or a surface coating, this is not going to apply to you. But what does it mean to be a surface coating? Uh, well, a surface coating is something that's applied to a substrate that does not absorb into the substrate, meaning it's sitting on the surface. So examples that we see here uh, that require lead in paint and surface coatings testing uh, in a cloth diaper context are frequently uh, screen printed fabrics and then painted zippers and snaps. Uh, and with painted zippers and snaps, remember, um, again, with the puzzle piece method, that they're going to need total lead content testing for whatever the zipper and snap is made of, and then lead and paints and surface coatings testing for the paint that's sitting on top of that snap. All right, the third requirement uh, is flammability testing. And flammability testing on general wearing apparel is in our regulations part 1610. That applies to uh, all textiles that are used for adult and children's wearing apparel, and cloth diapers are children's wearing apparel. Um, this, just of note, this flammability testing um, section does not apply to certain types of um, hats, gloves, footwear, and inner lining fabrics. Uh, and then for children's sleepwear, that's got to meet a more stringent standard. So I just wanted to highlight that for those of you that might be making other type of apparel items um, and wondering whether or not the flammability testing of 1610 would apply to those items. So uh, vinyl plastic film uh, is the other flammability testing requirement. And again, very frequently uh, applies here because uh, vinyl plastic film really is a disposable diapers um, material. It would be unsupported vinyl plastic film that could be transparent, translucent, and opaque, but it needs to be uncovered or exposed in wearing apparel to require flammability testing to 1611. Um, sometimes in vinyl cloth diaper inserts, if those are exposed, this would apply, but again, very limited circumstances. I just wanted to bring it to your attention though. So um, for flammability, there are some exemptions for flammability testing, and those can be found in our regulation section 1610.1 section D. Uh, and the fabrics that do not require flammability testing are broken into two main categories. The first one is plain surface fabrics uh, that exceed a certain weight. And that weight is 88.2 grams per square meter or 2.6 ounces per square yard, regardless of fiber content. So that's the first uh, type of fabric that would be, or type of textile that could be exempted from flammability testing. And then the second group are plain and raised surface fabrics that are made of six materials uh, or any combination of them, regardless of weight. And those materials are acrylic, moda acrylic, nylon, olefin, polyester, and wool. Um, so, I, you know, point to take away from the flammability uh, testing exemptions and the, um, the list of materials that we know aren't going to exceed the lead content or total lead content is when sourcing materials, if you would like to try to limit your obligation to test because that can sometimes, you know, add to the expense associated with, or it always adds to the expense associated with um, getting a product to market, then if you are uh, creative in sourcing your materials, and you check 1500.91 for total leg content um, exceptions list, and you check the flammability exemptions list, and you manage to pick textiles that fall under both, then you can avoid uh, testing in certain circumstances. So flammability testing, I just wanted to highlight um, some of the things associated with it and how it works, because we do get some questions about um, what does it mean to be different classes of uh, fabric and you know under flammability testing. So what flammability testing standards do is they classify the flammability of a textile into three classes and that's class one, two, three. And it's based on two main things, which is the average burn time over several specimens uh, or the speed that they're that they burn, and then the surface characteristics of the fabric. And class three textiles are considered dangerously flammable and are not suitable for use in clothing because they rapidly and intensively burn. So um, this is just a picture of a sample being prepped. 
uh, at our testing lab. And for flammability testing, uh, you'll want to have, uh, and again, this is all in 1610, and the testing procedure is outlined there. You'll want to have um, a 2 by 6 inch specimen, and you can see that attached to the plate there. Uh, it's held at a 45 degree angle. There's a 16 millimeter flame, a one second ignition. Uh, the ignition has to take place on the surface. Uh, the burn time is recorded. Um, there's a prescribed sample prep on, uh, you know, what you need to do before you put the sample uh, on the plate and begin the burning process and then what you do afterwards. And then refurbishing is required. Uh, and refurbishing is laundering um, the textile in whatever way is going to be prescribed um, for whoever's going to wear it. So, uh, again, very complex, the uh, flammability testing procedure, and it's outlined in 16 CFR 1610. So other things to keep in mind on children's clothing, small parts. Um, sometimes cloth diapers have small potential small parts in them, and you can see some examples of small parts. Uh, the toggle, which uh, I frankly have not seen on cloth diapers, but could certainly exist. And then you see buttons, which I, I have seen on cloth diapers, so um, or cloth diaper examples. So things to keep in mind with um, things like those toggles or those buttons are that Children's clothing and accessories are exempted from the small parts regulations. Many of you know small parts does apply uh, to children's toys if they're intended for children under the age of three, and many children's products if intended for um, children under the age of three. Certainly cloth diapers are. However, uh, children's clothing and accessories are exempted from the small parts regs, but you need to make sure those things are secure. Uh, and I'll talk about a recall example on children's apparel and highlight why that's important. Um, but suffice to say for now that if buttons or toggles start falling off of your cloth diapers because they're poorly constructed or they're not properly attached, um, then our agency could take a look at that um, based on a report or our own internal investigation and determine that that could be a product hazard. Um, so if you are using uh, toggles or buttons, any kind of fastener that might be affixed to your cloth diapers, you want to make sure that those are very secure and don't have the ability to be uh, pulled off. All right, so I want to touch on the small batch manufacturer registration benefits because uh, many people attending uh, may qualify as a small batch manufacturer, and one of the questions we frequently get is, what are the benefits if I register? So at the outset, I just want to say, Registration is not required at all by our agency. However, if you do register, there are certain benefits. So let's talk about those. And we'll first start with what it takes to qualify as a small batch manufacturer. Uh, the qualifications in this calendar year, you must meet two requirements. And that's a gross revenue requirement and a limit on the amount of manufactured products um, that fall under your registration in a calendar year. So for gross revenue, Last calendar year, you cannot have exceeded right under 1.1 million, and that figures on your screen, and you cannot have manufactured more than 7,500 units of the covered product that qualifies you as a small batch manufacturer. So in the context of cloth diapers, what are the benefits of registering as a small batch manufacturer? Um, the benefit is that uh, registered eligible small batch manufacturers may be able to avoid third-party testing at independent CPSC accepted labs for specific tests on children's products. And one example is the flammability test for uh, general wearing apparel in 16 CFR Part 1610. Now, um, registered eligible small batch manufacturers can conduct first party testing or manufacturer testing um, in this context. However, you must make sure that you are strictly meeting the requirements of 1610 and its sample prep and testing procedures, which are extensive. Um, if you are interested in this or you have specific questions, please feel free to reach out to us and uh, we're happy to seek guidance with um, the groups within our agency that have much more expertise on this than I do. You can find out more information on the benefits of small batch manufacturer registering uh, on our website at cpsc.gov forward slash small batch. And again, it appears as a hyperlink on your screen. It's a hyperlink in the handout on the right hand side uh, of your screen. Uh, in the PDF version of, these, of this document. All right, um, I love charts, as many people who know me know, so I just wanted to give you guys a chart, uh, if you are a manufacturer of cloth diapers, that you could have handy and it would be an easy reference for you. So um, 
things to keep in mind here. I've got the four uh, potential types of testing that we talked about at the outset. And then I've got three columns. The first one is, is third-party CPSC accepted lab testing required for each of these types of tests? And we'll talk about that by test in just a second. The second um, of the um, columns on the right-hand side is, can written assurances from a supplier be relied upon by a registered small batch manufacturer? So for those of you attending today that are registered small batch manufacturers or you are uh, eligible to register and you were considering whether or not you should register, this will let you know the benefits associated with that. And then finally, could a domestic manufacturer rely on timely component part testing from a supplier to avoid retesting for each of these types of tests? So uh, let's take a look at the left-hand side and look at each of the types of testing, and then we'll look at, uh, we'll go right across each of the columns. So first one, uh, total leg content, which applies to accessible parts. Usually total leg content applies to the textiles that you use for your cloth diapers. It would also include polyurethane laminate. And then the snaps and zippers that you use, the substrate there, be it metal or polyresin. So uh, third-party CPSC accepted lab testing required? No on total leg content. Uh, can you rely on written assurances if you're a registered small batch manufacturer? Yes. So what is a written assurance from your supplier? It is something on their letterhead that's certifying to you that uh, the product that they're supplying you with complies with our leg content limit of 100 ppm. So that is, this should be uh, distinct in your mind from a testing report. But again, that is only uh, eligible registered small batch manufacturers that can utilize written assurances on total leg content. Uh, and then on the, also on the right-hand side for total leg content, uh, a domestic manufacturer can rely on component part testing from a supplier on total leg content for their textiles or their snaps and zippers. For lead and paint and surface coatings, uh, you'll see that it's the flip of the lead content above it. Um, you do need third-party CPSC accepted lab testing. So if you have things like painted snaps or zippers or screen printing, you're going to need to have that lab tested by a CPSC accepted testing lab. And we'll talk about how to find those in just a second. You cannot re rely on a written assurance that the lead and paint and surface coatings uh, does not exceed our 90 ppm limit if you're a registered small batch manufacturer. But if you get a testing report um, that is on the component part, be it the painted snap or zipper that is uh, from your supplier that's certifying to you um, that it's past the 90 ppm lead and paint and surface coatings limit, you can rely on that component part testing. For flammability on general wearing apparel under 1610, uh, that does not require third-party CPSC accepted lab testing. However, you can, as a registered small batch manufacturer, rely on a written assurance that the uh, textile that they're supplying you with passes the apparel flammability testing. And you can also, as a domestic manufacturer, rely on timely component part testing. And what does it mean to be timely, timely component part testing? We'll talk about that in a second, but it's usually a testing report that's within uh, the past year and that you make sure test your actual product component. And then finally, for vinyl plastic film flammability testing, uh, as it might apply to um, diaper inserts that are exposed in some way, um, again, very isolated um, application of 1611 and flammability testing here. You do not have to have that CPSC accepted um, third-party lab tested. And you do have the ability to rely on written assurances uh, if you are an eligible registered small batch manufacturer. And you can also rely on timely component part testing from your supplier of the vinyl plastic film. So uh, we just talked about all the testing requirements. How do you find a testing lab? Uh, if you are required to use a CPSC accepted lab, you've got to uh, find that CPSC accepted lab via our website. And I've got the site uh, link there that uh, is available in your handout at cpsc.gov forward slash lab search. You have the ability to narrow your search by region or by country uh, and by scope, meaning the type of product testing that you need. And there is a lab search demo video available on our website. And I've got the hyperlink in your handout. Um, we are working um, on the lab search page and we're trying to make it a little more user friendly. In the meantime, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to help you find a CPSC accepted testing lab uh, for your cloth diapers and the lab search demo video 
uh, can also probably help you figure out how to best use that uh, website if you uh, you know, are doing this after hours or at a time when uh, Will or myself are not available to help you on the phone. So uh, testing frequency. Uh, there is a periodic testing rule. Uh, one of the questions that we hear a lot is how often do I have to get my cloth diapers um, tested? Well, uh, the main answer is that a vast majority of manufacturers and importers need to make sure that they're testing their products once per year. Uh, and that applies, that is the default. Uh, however, if you have a production testing plan, and if you've got questions about that, we can talk to you more in depth about what that means. You do have the ability with a production testing plan in place to test every two years. Uh, and I'll caveat that in just a second about material changes. Um, every three years requires that you have a testing lab accredited under that ISO standard. Um, very, very, very few manufacturers are going to qualify for every three year testing. Uh, and the takeaway here, the vast majority, it's going to be once per year. So uh, testing requirements, what is the proper procedure? Um, manufacturers and importers need to submit the samples to the testing lab. Uh, and we get questions on that. We'll uh, talk about that a little bit later in the webinar. Um, the CPSC Accepted Testing Lab receives your samples. They perform the applicable testing, and then they provide you the testing results. Our recommendation to lower your cost, you want to find one lab that can do all the testing that you need to have done. Uh, labs are accredited or accepted by the CPSC on a test-by-test -test basis, so uh, they may not be able to perform uh, all the testing that you might need to have done on your product. So when looking for a testing lab, you want to make sure that they are accepted by us, especially in the case of children's products, that they can test uh, or conduct all the testing that you need to have done on your cloth diapers. And um, for importers, the testing needs to be completed before entry at the port or you distribute them in commerce. And you need to have uh, proof of that ready uh, to be provided. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more depth in just a second. So I said I would caveat the testing requirements a second ago um, when I talked about um, every two years with a production testing plan or once per year uh, for the vast majority of manufacturers. That changes if you make a material change to the design of your product. And what does it mean to be a material change? We get a lot of questions on that. And truly, that is a case-by-case -case basis uh, question that uh, you know, I can't give you a broad answer on. But if you do have questions on whether or not something's a material change, please feel free to reach out to myself or Will uh, in our office. And we'll, we can get guidance internally on uh, whether or not what you've done is considered a material change that would necessitate retesting the effective component part or the entire product. You do have the option to do either one in most circumstances, but again, it's case by case. Um, so we're happy to help you uh, if you believe that you might have a material change on the design of your cloth diapers. That could mean that you need to test uh, more frequently than that 12-month uh, window. Once that uh, retesting on the component part of the entire product has happened after a material change, you need to make sure that you issue a new children's product certificate. And who's responsible for children's product certificates? Manufacturers or importers are responsible for making sure that a, CPS or a CPC is available based on passing test results. All right, so I hope everybody is uh, ready to go and excited about uh, interactive audience polling. Uh, we're going to see how well you've all been paying attention. And uh, I'm going to you know, hopefully you guys are going to get all the answers right, but let's just see how we do. So I'm going to go ahead and put the first question up. And that question hopefully is appearing on your screen. And it is, do reusable pocket diapers have to bear a permanent tracking label? And these are questions based on ones that we get quite frequently in our office. So let's see as a group how we do. All right, and it looks like uh, everybody has voted, so I'm going to go ahead and close the results. And uh, let's share and see what we as a group uh, thought the results 
were on whether or not reusable pocket diapers need to bear a permanent tracking label. Uh, and it looks like, by and large, we thought the answer was yes. So uh, let's see if we were right. And good news, uh, we, we are correct. So here's what you guys need to keep in mind. If we're talking about reusable pocket diapers that are sold in a set, uh, then the answer is yes. The reusable pocket diapers need permanent tracking information on them. So uh, great job, everybody. That was just our warm-up question. So let's see how we do on the second question. Again, these are based on real questions that we receive um, from manufacturers and importers of cloth diapers uh, each day. So the question here is, which lead limit applies to accessible polyurethane laminate in cloth diapers? Would it be the 100 ppm lead limit that applies to substrate lead or the 90 ppm lead limit for paint and surface coatings? All right, and I'll give you guys just a few more seconds. It looks like there's uh, an overwhelming response. All right, I'm going to close the poll, and uh, let's see what we as a group thought the answer was on which lead limit applies to accessible polyurethane laminate in cloth diapers. And it looks like the group uh, pretty overwhelmingly thinks that the answer is 100 ppm, which applies to... Uh, total lead content and substrates. Let's see if you guys were right. And the answer is 100 ppm uh, for lead in substrates. So uh, the large majority of you guys were correct. Okay, well, you're, um, you're doing great so far. So let's see how you do on our third question about cloth diapers, uh, also frequently received from members of the public. All right, the question here, are cloth diapers considered children's sleepwear subject to the more stringent children's sleepwear flammability standard? Ooh, and people an are answering very quickly. That's, that's a good indicator because um, we get so many questions here because young children sleep frequently in cloth diapers, so uh, we get questions about whether or not it's considered children's sleepwear. So everybody voted so, so quickly that I would go ahead and close the poll. And then we'll take a look at the results and see what we thought as a group on whether or not um, cloth diapers fall under the children's sleepwear flammability testing standards. And it looks like I haven't been able to stump you guys so far because a huge majority, 85% of you, said that the answer was no. Um, let's take a look and see if, that, uh, if you guys are right. And the answer is no. Uh, cloth diapers are considered general wearing apparel, so they are not subject to the more stringent children's sleepwear flammability standards. They are instead subject to the general wearing flammability standards of 1610. All right, I got another question queued up for you guys. Let's see how you do on this one. And the question here is, are cloth diapers subject to phthalates testing? Thank you to everybody who's participating. You guys, you're on the ball, and I'm, I'm watching the uh, participation percentages uh, go off the charts. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll here, and let's see what the group uh, thought in terms of whether or not cloth diapers would be subject to phthalates testing. And as a group, you overwhelmingly thought that the answer was no, that cloth diapers would not be subject to phthalates testing. Let's see if you were correct. You were correct. The answer is no. Phthalates testing applies only to children's toys and child care articles that facilitate sleeping and eating. Uh, our agency has put out guidance, and it's available on our website. I'm happy to point you um, to those resources that children, child care articles that facilitate sleeping and eating uh, would include something like a baby bib, um, sippy cups, and utensils, and children's sleepwear as well. 
All right, let's see how you do on the fifth question uh, that I've got queued up for you. And the question here is, are disposable diaper liners subject to the same testing requirements as cloth diapers? I will give you guys uh, just a few more seconds to get your answer in before we close the poll. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And let's see what we as a group thought on whether or not disposable diaper liners were subject to the same testing requirements as cloth diapers. Looks like the large majority of you guys thought that the answer is no, that there are different requirements that apply to disposable diaper liners. Let's see if you were right. And you guys were correct. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, that dis diaper liners, as with cloth diapers, need to meet leg content requirements. So in that way, disposable diaper liners and uh, cloth diapers are the same in leg content requirements. However, on flammability, they are different. Disposable diaper liners uh, that are completely unexposed to the outside do not require flammability testing. And that's per our regulation, 16 CFR. 161034. So that one was a bit tricky because that's information that I didn't provide, uh, but you guys already knew the answer. So let's see how you do on question number six. And the question here is, are cloth diapers subject to the small parts ban? Because they are intended for children under age three. All right, and I'll give you guys just a few more seconds to get your answers in because uh, this is trending uh, not in a decisive fashion. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, and let's see what we as a group thought the answer was on whether or not cloth diapers are subject to the small parts ban because they're intended for children under three. You can see the group, uh, it trends towards yes, uh, but we're we're close to evenly split. We're 60-40 uh, on our percentages. Let's see if the uh, folks that selected yes uh, were correct. And the answer here is actually no. Cloth diapers are exempt from small parts testing and the small parts ban under 16 CFR 1501.3D. However, uh, because children's clothing and apparel, which cloth diapers are, uh, do not require small parts testing uh, and therefore there's no small parts ban on them. However, please keep in mind, and this is the caveat from earlier, that all snaps and buttons still need to be secure on those cloth diapers because you don't want to be in a uh, recall situation based on a product defect. So as a group, we're doing great. We've got one more question that I'm going to go ahead and queue up for you guys that is a little bit more specific that again is based on the types of questions uh, that we have received um, from you know, fellow manufacturers and importers of cloth diapers. All right, and the question that you guys uh, are taking a look at is a manufacturer of cloth diapers where the diapers are made entirely of bamboo fiber and Velcro, do, does lead testing need to be conducted on those diapers? All right, I'm going to give you guys just a few more moments to get your question, I mean your, uh, your answers to the question then. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and close the poll because it looks like uh, everybody's participated. So uh, let's see what we as a group thought the answer was. Then we'll see whether or not we were right. So 72% thought the answer was no that uh, cloth diapers made entirely of bamboo fiber and Velcro would not require lead content testing. Uh, so let's see whether or not you guys were correct. And the majority of you were correct. Uh, those cloth diapers would not require lead content testing and that's pursuant to the list that we discussed earlier, which is in 16 CFR 1500.91, specifically D7, 
uh, that list unadulterated and untreated bamboo fiber, and Velcro um, is included by our agency uh, interpretation in 1500.91 in the list of materials that do not require total leg content testing based on years of testing by our agency on things that we know will pass and will not exceed the um, substrate leg content level of 100 ppm. So uh, thank you everybody for participating in the poll. Um, let's take a look at children's product certificates and what would go in a children's product certificate that covers cloth diapers. Uh, there are seven pieces of information that need to be on a children's product certificate and we'll go through each one. Caveat here, this is for demonstrative purposes only so it might not include everything that applies to your cloth diaper based on design. Some of the things that are included here may not apply uh, based on the design of your cloth diaper. So we're just using it for an example. Uh, and number one, you need to describe the product covered by the certificate. So that's going to be a full um, description as best you can of the cloth diapers that you're manufacturing or importing. And number two, you're going to cite to each CPSC safety rule to which you are certifying compliance. And I've listed out there the four things that could apply that we've covered today which is the two types of lead testing and the two different types of flammability testing. Again, keeping in mind vinyl plastic film only applies to uncovered and exposed vinyl plastic film. Large majority are going to fall right under 1610 uh, for clothing textile flammability testing. Number three, you need to make sure that you include your importer or domestic manufacturer contact information. Number four is the contact info for the person that maintains your testing records very frequently. Uh, that individual might not be within your organization, might be somebody outside. So include as much contact info as you possibly can uh, to help our import staff uh, and our compliance staff take a look at these certificates and get in touch with the right people for testing records. Uh, number five, uh, the date and place of manufacture of the good that this certificate is covering, in this case, uh, your cloth diapers. Number six, the location of testing and the date of test on which the certification is based. However, if you are relying on a regulation, the two of which we've discussed today have to do with total leg content testing, uh, the list of materials that would not require total leg content testing in 1500.91, or flammability testing exemptions in 1610.1D, if you are relying on those to uh, not have to test your product, you want to make sure that those citations are listed out in number six, and six should parallel two in terms of the sections on your certificate. Uh, and be as specific as you can in 1500.91 and 1610.1D on which portion of those um, exempted or accepted materials um, you are relying on. So, you know, if it's the weight of the fabric, put the weight of the fabric. If it's the content of the fabric, put the content of the fabric uh, in number six. And then number seven is the contact info of the testing lab that you used. And again, you want to provide as much information as you can. And lastly, I've got the asterisk at the top to remind you that if you are a registered small batch manufacturer, you want to make sure to include your registration number on your children's product certificate. All right, uh, important things to remember on children's product certificates. Uh, all children's products require them. That includes cloth diapers. Manufacturers and importers have to be the ones that are certifying in their CPC that the product that they're importing or manufacturing complies. And cpsc.gov forward slash CPC is our website for children's product certificates. And there are two samples on our website, um, which is hyperlinked in the handout on the right-hand side of your screen. And those samples uh, are for children's clothing, which you can absolutely use for your cloth diapers, or for a children's toy, if that's something that you're also manufacturing. And with children's product certificates, uh, three main things to remember here. Those certificates need to accompany uh, each shipment, and there are different ways of doing that. Uh, I'll talk about electronic certificates in just a second. A copy of the certificate needs to be furnished to each distributor or retailer of the product that you're working with. You do not have a requirement to provide it to the ultimate consumer. Uh, a copy of the certificate also needs to be available uh, to our commission, uh, our representatives of our agency, or Customs and Border Protection upon request. And then finally, uh, electronic certificates. Our commission has ruled that electronic certificates are absolutely fine. Uh, but those must be completed, or sorry, created. The certificate needs to be created no later than the time of shipment or first distribution within the United States. So it's not an after-the-fact thing where you can uh, go in and create a certificate after the fact. 
All right, uh, lastly, I'm just going to highlight a recall example, which is not on cloth diapers, but it is on children's apparel for a defect, because um, this could apply to cloth diapers. Many cloth diapers have snaps, just like this onesie does at the bottom. And you can see in terms of units, there were 479,000 of these onesies sold. The recall date here is August 2015, and the problem was that the snaps weren't sufficiently affixed to the onesie, um, so they came off and they were a small part that posed a choking hazard. So even though, important to remember, even though small parts, the small parts ban or uh, the small parts testing does not apply to children's apparel, you cannot have uh, a product defect like this where the snaps are coming off of the product. So you want to make sure that you fully secure the snaps uh, or closure items to the cloth diapers that you are manufacturing. All right, some uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission business resources. Uh, I've got my contact information up there. You've got my email address. The telephone number that's there, 301-504-7945, is our business line. Uh, it rings at both myself and my colleague Will's desk. And we answer as long as we are uh, sitting at our desk and not at a meeting or on another call. We do have a Twitter feed. If you would like to follow us on Twitter, we post uh, information about things like this webinar or speaking engagements that we have uh, or roundtables that might be uh, taking place and that we're going to take part in. So if you want to um, stay in touch with the Small Business Office, that's the way to do that. I've got the lab search page uh, on the left-hand side, which we discussed earlier. It's useful for helping you find a testing lab. Again, we're happy to help you do that. Uh, the desktop reference guide, which is useful and has all different types of consumer products uh, and the testing and labeling requirements that apply to them. Uh, the link is there. And then the regulatory robot, which is an interactive bot uh, that helps you figure out what requirements apply to your product based on asking you a series of interactive questions and generating a customized report at the end. All right, uh, a few last things to point out, and then I'll take uh, a few last questions at the end. We have an agency YouTube uh, channel now, and there is a playlist that's specific for our webinar series, just like the one we've conducted here today. This is the third in our series, uh, so the previous two are available on CPSC uh, webinar series playlist online, and again, that link is in the PDF uh, handout on the right hand side of your screen and then if you want to stay up to date on the things that we here at the Small Business Ombudsman's Office are working on uh, be it webinars or other things that might be going on with the Commission we try to do a nice job at the end of each month to issue a newsletter so that you can keep track of um, Commission activities that you might be able to submit a public comment on and to sign up for that monthly newsletter you can do so at cpsc.gov forward slash email. You enter your email address and you'll want to make sure that you click Small Business Ombudsman Updates. All right, well with that, it looks like uh, time is up. I want to make sure that we end on time. So uh, thank you everyone for attendance and I'll see everybody uh, next month. Thank you. <laughs>